All right. Once again, we are we get to read about a real war that happened. I mean, you guys like your video games. Uh, you know, a lot of people aren't allowed to play these video games. Um, but why do you like them? You like the strate the strategy, the strategery. I think that's a word. Um, you you like. Uh, I mean, some kids are drawn to like the violence of it. This, if you really think about it, it's kind of crazy that in fifth grade, we're allowed to read about a war that happened, okay? So we're reading about uh, um, something that happened during the American Revolution. It happened in war. And what you have to do is you have to try to figure out a way to realize that these were real human beings with real emotions and they might not have had TikTok and smartphones and um, you know all these other things that we have today, but they had the same kind of emotions that we have, and they're very similar um, to to if if you were actually there, um, all the same emotions would occur. So the genre is narrative nonfiction. It tells about real people, things, and events and places. So as you read, look for information that tells a story illustrations to help the idea in the text in events in time order. So we are on page 393 in your textbook. You guys obviously remember what's going on during the American Revolution. You have all these colonists that live here in America. And then you have this king from the other side of the ocean who sent all of his soldiers in to say, hey, they're going to come and regulate you guys. Uh, and if they knock on your door and say, hey, we need your house, you give them your house. And all these colonists were like, we're not living in a world like this. Yeah, they are the most powerful army in the world, but I would rather die fighting them for my own freedom than to live here under their order. In 1777, a barber named William Hayes closed up shop and joined General Washington's Continental Army in this revolution against England. He went to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where a Prussian general named Baron von Steuben was training the Patriot troops in the formal, normal rules of battling uh, the armies that, or the, I'm sorry, that the, the armies used in those days. Like many of the women at the time, Hayes' wife, Mary, her nickname was Molly. She went with him. Some people think that she is the legendary heroine, Molly Pitcher. General George Washington was commander in chief for the Continental Army. He and other officers, plus a, a, a bedraggled army of about oh, 12,000 men and boys were camped at Valley Forge just before Christmas of 1777. The snow lay deep on the ground and Washington's troops had run out of everything that they needed to keep fighting. Washington begged the Second Continental Congress to supply them with food and supplies, but nothing came. I mean, imagine having to, to, to hang outside right now with broken shoes and not fully clothed or really old, wet, damp clothes. Imagine how that would, would affect your army's ability to fight. It was so cold that soldiers had to stand on their hats in the snow to keep the feet from freezing. Their shoes had holes in them from, from tramping over miles of rough and stony ground. They didn't have any blankets. They didn't have any warm clothes. They didn't have enough to eat. Their camp was a filthy mess. So many of them were very sick. Each day, more and more soldiers deserted and others died. Molly and other women who'd followed husbands, sons, fathers, and brothers to Valley Forge, well, they did absolutely anything that they could to help. They cooked, cleaned, they washed and mended the clothes, and they tried to nurse the sick. But no matter what they did, more and more soldiers died every day. Things began to look up when the Second Continent Congress finally set up supplies. Remember, so that's like their government. 
which they had in place at the time. So they finally got those supplies sent to General Washington. General Washington began planning to go to battle again now that they had the new supplies. At the end of June, a scout brought news. A large number of the British soldiers led by Sir Henry Clinton, they were gathering at Mammoth Courthouse near the New Jersey shore. The fight everyone had been preparing for was coming very soon. Washington ordered General Charles Lee to lead an advance guard of 5,000 soldiers to attack the British. He'd send in rear guard of more men soon after the fighting was underway. So what that was going to happen, he was going to start fighting, start fighting, start fighting, and then half of his soldiers would actually surprise them and come up from behind them while they were in the middle of their fight. That was a strategic plan. William Hayes was among Lee's advance guard marching to battle, as she always had. Molly followed, because Molly always followed her husband. Now, winter at Valley Forge, it was bitter cold. But then to go to June of 1778 in New Jersey, it was hotter than anyone could ever remember. It was just after sunrise when American soldiers fired on the British near Mammoth Courthouse. Molly could see that the day was going to be a scorcher, super hot. Heat and humidity were already shimmering up from the ground, so she decided exactly what her job was going to be that day. She spotted a green and mossy place where a spring gushed up. She ran and filled her pitcher with cold water. She raced back to the battlefield, she died, dodging cannon fire and musket fire, and she carried her pitcher full of water for any American soldiers who needed a drink. So this is where I tell you, don't just read the story. Literally try to picture the emotions going through her mind as she was running with water through battlefield, through gunfire, through cannon. And this really happened. The Americans knew all about hot and humid summer days. They knew that they had to keep cool any way that they could. They ignored what the Baron von Steuben had taught them about looking neat and military at all times. So they stripped all of their coats off, their belts, their wigs, their hats, their boots, their shoes, their stockings, and they threw them all and tossed them into the grass. Smoke, noise, the smell of gunpowder filled the air. Molly didn't pay any attention. All morning, all Molly did was run back and forth from the battlefield to the spring, spring to the battlefield, bringing water to the men who collapsed in the heat. Over and over, she heard the urgent cry, Molly, pitcher! Still more British soldiers, under orders from Lord Cornwallis, marched towards the courthouse. The men formed a line of, so this is the other side, the British, the, the lobster coats. They formed a line of scarlet, like a, like a winding river of blood. They were a magnificent and terrifying sight, because remember how many more soldiers they had too. But their fine uniforms weren't what they should have been wearing in the sun that blazed down on them. Each man wore this tall black fur hat, this scarlet coat of thick, warm wool, a wide shining black belt held a sharp sword, a white waistcoat, matching woolen pants with knee-high, brightly polished black boots, each marked with his eyes straight, a musket on his shoulder, knapsack full of heavy lead balls of ammunition on his back. They moved to the stirring music of war. Drums were beating, fifes were playing, trumpets were sounding. The soldiers dropped as the sun rose higher. These Englishmen had never felt such heat in their home across the sea. It was almost 100 degrees in New Jersey that day. Men grew faint and dizzy, and they fell to the ground. But their companions went on marching. They never stopped or broke step. Even when one man or more collapsed, 56 British soldiers died of heat stroke just that day. That didn't stop them, though. All morning, more and more scarlet coats marched onto the field. Many American soldiers panicked at the sight of so many 
General Lee couldn't maintain order. His soldiers fought, forgot all about fighting in the disciplinary way of Baron von Steuben that they, he had taught them. Instead, they ran in terror this way and that way, hiding in ditches up in apple trees, beneath hedges. This was not the kind of warfare that happened back then where you were like snipers, right? It was you march in a straight line with respect and order, you load your guns, you fire, and then you go to the back of the line. The guys in front of you go down on a knee, they fire, they go to the back of the line, and you continued this. You never hid your body. This was the way that you, you fought. Until the colonists were like, no, we're going to hide in ditches. We're going to go up apple trees. We're going to figure out ways where we can sneak up on them and take, there's so many of these, these, these British soldiers. General Lee was sure that there'd be a massacre of his troops before morning turned to noon. So he gave the orders to retreat. Molly saw that some of the men, including Williams, they didn't listen to the general. They didn't repeat, they didn't give up, they didn't run away. They kept fighting. The sun grew hotter, and as long as any member of the Continental Army needed water to drink, Molly wasn't going anywhere. She stayed right there and fought with them by giving them water. On one of her trips to the spring, she stumbled over the body of an American soldier. She just assumed he was dead until she heard a moan. The British were advancing quickly and the guns were aimed straight at their enemies, their foes. Molly knew she could run to safety, but the wounded man couldn't let or couldn't walk, let alone run. He lay directly in the line of fire and would surely be killed if he stayed there. He was a good sized fellow, but Molly wasted no time wondering how she'd do what she had to do. So she picked the man up, she slung him over her shoulder and ran to the clump of the bushes away from the gunfire. She laid him down there on the grass in the shade. She ran back towards the spring and passed the cannon William was firing just in time to see a ball from a British musket hit him. William fell to the ground. She examined her, her husband's wound. She did see that he was not going to die from it, but he couldn't no longer fire his cannon. Someone had to. Molly grabbed a long ramrod, she plunged it into the barrel of the cannon, and she fired it. She kept fighting. A ball fired low from a British musket came whizzing straight towards Molly. She quickly spread her legs wide, and the musket ball passed between them. It never touched her, but her skirt and petticoat were ripped and became a good deal shorter than it had been. She muttered that it could have been worse and went back to work firing the cannon. Soon, General Washington galloped onto the field riding Nelson, his fine horse, who never shied at the, the noise of guns or cannons, no matter how close they were. Washington carried the flag commander in chief, 13 stars in a circle of the field of blue silk. The flag fluttered and flew above the smoke of the battle. It wasn't as bright as the scarlet coats of British soldiers wore, Everyone who stayed and fought on, it was cheering and glorious sight. And for us, the hot and steamy day, the Continental Army fought the way that Baron von Steuben had taught it to. George Washington saw to that. As he galloped over the battlefield, shouting orders and sputtering his men on, and spurring his men on, he was amazed to catch a glimpse of a woman. She was blurred by the smoke that surrounded her. Her face was smudged with gunpowder and sweat, but George Washington saw her take a deep breath and then run and shove the long ramrod into the big gun with as much force as possible. The cannon boomed. The explosion shook the ground, but the women paid no attention, or the woman paid no attention. She just got ready to fire that cannon again. When the sun set, the fighting stopped. Neither side can go into the darkness, go on in the darkness, exhausted British and American soldiers put down their guns and they tended to their dead and their wounded soldiers. Late that night, they sat down to eat and rest and to prepare themselves for yet another day of battle. That same night, General Washington asked some of his officers about that woman that he'd seen firing a gun. 
He listened to what they said about how she carried water through the gunfire to the soldiers all that morning. Washington ordered that the woman be brought before him. He told her that she'd been as brave in battle as any man that he has ever heard of. He decided that he'd, she'd earn the rank of sergeant in the Continental Army. As she listened to what the tall, strong general said, Molly Hayes, she never felt so proud in her life. No man who heard General Washington speak to her that night doubted that Molly had earned her rank. As the news spread through the troops, no soldier sneered at the thought of a woman being a sergeant in his army, even though no one presented or no one present had ever heard of such a thing. That night, Sergeant Molly Hayes laid down on the grass at the edge of the field beside William and the rest of the soldiers of the Continental Army. Long after the stars filled the sky, General George Washington spread his cape over the grass, tied Nelson to a tree, and lay down with his weary soldiers. As he lay gazing up at the stars, planning a strategy for the next day's battles, fires danced on the hill across the field where the British were camping. The voices of many men carried through the night. Sentries marched back and forth, keeping their endless watch. It was very late before everything was quiet except for the chorus of frogs singing in the nearby swamp. Molly and the other American soldiers rose before the sun. They'd had some sleep and they were ready for fight again. Many believed that they could win, but they didn't fight the British that day. No scarlet-coated soldier marched onto that field, for they have gone away. Sir Henry Clinton and Lord Cornwallis they ordered for their men to retreat. They didn't want their men to fight that wily old fox again this morning. They were afraid they'd lose. Washington's Continental Army did not fight like farmers as the British leaders had been sure that they would because they fought like soldiers. And one of those soldiers was a woman. All right, so that was the story of Molly Pitcher. Okay, we are going to have a Google Doc um, to rock out some of these, uh, some of the, the comprehension questions. Make sure that you guys read along with the story, and, uh, and that's all.